the general public doesn't realize why this area is considered globally important from a scientific perspective. And that's because uh, the geographic position means that we get a meeting of the climates from north, south, east, west, which means it's very unpredictable day to day, but it means that a lot of different plants have adapted to this area. And this is the only place where we have plants that where this is the southern end of northern plants, the, the north end of southern plants, same east and west. I have prickly pear cactus growing under oak trees in my yard. This is the only place in the world where that happens. And that's understanding the connection between plants and how they adapt to the place where they live and the articulation of that idea by a man named Henry Chander Coles in uh, 1898 is the reason that Northwest Indiana is in science considered the birthplace of ecology in North America. My name is Lee Botts. Uh, I live in the Miller Beach section of Gary, Indiana, beside a wonderful natural interdermal pond. Uh, I am very active uh, since I retired from full-time work. Uh, with the Dunes Learning Center, which I helped to establish uh, with the Save the Dunes Council, with the Alliance for the Great Lakes, which I helped to organize as the Lake Michigan Federation back in 1970, and uh, various other uh, organizations. No, I don't, it wasn't called environmental awareness, but I remember someone, my grandfather probably, and he wouldn't consider himself an environmentalist, he had been a homesteader in northwest Oklahoma near the beginning of what used to be called the Great American Desert, uh, the Great Plains. And he must have been the one that explained to me why he planted what were called shelter belts, which was a New Deal program to plant trees to try to reduce uh, the dust storms. And I was about four years old and I was riding in front of him, sitting in front of him on a horse and we were riding out to a pasture to see how well the shelter belt out there was growing. And that's, uh, that's the first memory I have that fits with. And I think maybe that's why I think now I, I, I say to a lot of my environmental friends, I give up on you guys. I got to work on the kids. That's the really important thing. Starting in the 50s, the League of Women Voters made water pollution their primary uh, focus for some years. Um, they got uh, the 1965 uh, Federal Water Pollution Control Act passed um, uh, in Chicago as part of my growing involvement. I didn't know it at the time, but growing involvement with these issues. I became involved uh, with the public participation under that law, but it didn't work very well. And the concern about pollution was growing. Uh, Silent Spring had been published in the uh, early uh, 60s and a lot of the situations that Rachel Carson described in Silent Spring were in the Midwest. I joined Save the Dunes Council in 1959. Many Chicago people had been involved uh, in the effort to get a national park authorized by Congress in the dunes. In fact, the first idea for creating a national park uh, came from the Chicago businessman named Stephen Mather who was the first director of the National Park Service appointed in 1916 when the National Park Service was established and the, practically the first thing he did uh, was to propose what he called a sand dunes national park to stretch between Gary to Michigan City along the south shore of um, of uh, Lake Michigan and in 1916 there was a big hearing by the US Senate in Chicago where this idea of getting a Dunes National Park was a big civic issue and the support was immense. Uh, it's, it's a national park, it's not just an Indiana park and I did join the, the Save the Dunes Council in a few years after it started in the late 1950s and was one of those people in Chicago that was very active um, with the effort to get the park and um, 
became friends with uh, Senator Paul Douglas, who was the Illinois politician who led the fight because no Indiana politician would do so because it was the official policy uh, reflected in many in laws and programs of the state of Indiana that the best use of the shoreline of Lake Michigan was industrialization and the intention had been to industrialize the shoreline entirely. And uh, I live in Indiana now because I, had, I loved the dunes, I raised my four children uh, coming frequently to the dunes, staying in the dunes in the summer. Uh, we had the good luck to own a, a second homes out here for periods of time when my kids were growing up. And I always wanted to sometime to live in the dunes. I didn't intend to become so involved. I thought I was retiring. My last full-time job, I was head of the City of Chicago's Environmental Agency under Mayor Washington. And I was devastated when he died uh, because uh, he had a vision. And I think one of the most fortunate things for me is that I've been able to work on these issues in several different ways. I was a volunteer, a citizen volunteer. Then I learned how to organize not-for-profit organizations, established the Lake Michigan Federation, went from there to work for EPA on behalf of the Great Lakes. Then I was appointed by President Carter as a head of a eight-state regional planning agency that was supposed to coordinate federal and state policies. And I was in that job until James Watt became Secretary of Interior and, uh, and um, Ronald Reagan became president and they abolished all these agencies and I got fired by James Watt. And then I went to Northwestern as a research uh, associate working on Great Lakes policy issues for several years. And my, as I said before, my last job was working for the city of Chicago. So I worked from inside government and outside government, on the system, in the system. And um, I learned there are a lot of different ways to make things happen. And that's what I feel really has been my greatest good fortune. Well, they have to start where they live. And, and, and the kids have made a tremendous difference. Um, in the 1980s, um, when the country was making this big effort to establish recycling programs and uh, stop just dumping garbage into landfills, every garbage, I was very much involved with that and it was one of the main things I had to deal with when I worked for the city of Chicago. Uh, the, the garbage collectors, they knew how to collect garbage. They didn't know what to do about recycling and every garbage collector I've ever talked to will say it was the kids that went home and said to their moms and dads they learned it probably at Earth Day. They probably learned it about Earth Day, about uh, recycling. They go home and they say, Mom, Dad, why aren't we recycling? And literally across the country it was the pressure from school kids through families that developed the public support to push efforts to change the system. And that's that's what it is, amounts to. It can't just be a, a one-time thing. We have to change how we work, you know, how we play, um, uh, uh, what we do, what we buy, what we do with the, the waste left over, and, and so forth. And so the kids are essential for making that happen. That's where I'm coming from. <laughs> well, it never was intended to be an annual event. It was meant to be a one-time teach-in. Again, the kids kept it going and the teachers have kept it going. So it is an important uh, event uh, and it does mobilize attention and so forth. But it will never um, make the, the difference that changing what we do every day and you know the cliche is every day has to be Earth Day. And so uh, I think that's where we have to keep pushing.